Dr. Lopez was originally from Venezuela. He obtained his DBM in 2010. From 2010 to 2017, he worked with the second largest pork producer in Russia, which has about 80,000 sows. He had several different roles within that company, working with Wean to Finish, head of health services, and head of genetic services. During this period, he had firsthand experience with two ASF breaks, and he is here today to share his experiences from that. Please welcome Dr. Lopez. All right. <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. First, uh, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, I had a very pleasant morning listening to different talks about biosecurity and of course, listening to Dr. Casey, uh, the situation in China is uh, very interesting for me. So now we're going to talk a little bit about my experiences uh, with ASF in Russia. Some of you may have already heard it in the Lehman Conference and, and different podcasts that uh, I've had the opportunity to do. But today I will expand a little more because I have more time, a little bit. I won't go deeply into the virus characteristics because we already covered, Dr. Casey already talked about it. So it's a, it's a large virus, 22 known genotypes. The, the one that's causing problems is the genotype 2. And the warthog is its natural reservoir, the, the Pumba. It's a highly resistant virus. It's found in all the secretions of the pig, saliva, urine, blood, uh, the meat, very important. And it's highly resistant. It's a virus that is very hard to kill. It is sensible to the disinfectants we use. But as we talked to, as we heard in this morning, it's all a matter of the um, time of exposure, the presence or absence of organic material, and the temperature that that disinfectant is applied to. So that has allowed the, the virus to survive even when we use the right disinfectant. We already saw this table in the previous presentation, so it survives for long periods of time in the meat. Let me stop working. Uh, I just want to point the attention to the blood, so 15 weeks, and here I want to point out how long it can survive in the meat, so those are two um, situations where the virus will survive long periods of time. And this is not working. Okay, so the disease itself is a reportable disease, it's not new, it's a re-emerging disease, it's been reported in Africa, it's been reported in, in the American continent, in Brazil, Cuba, so it's not new, it just came out in 2007, Georgia and the Caucasus, and it made its way into Russia. And uh, it's a highly contagious disease with mortality up to 100%. Uh, the transmission routes, I'm just going to say that there's um, different ways the virus can get around into pig farms. The incubation period varies and depends on the virulence of the strain. Reports from China report highly virulent strains. The ones we had in Russia were milder or medium virulence, so I have a different experience with ASF than the Chinese. Um, the virus can be, but can be shed during the incubation period, which means the animal will start to shed the virus even before it starts to show clinical signs. And that just, we need to be aware of that because if we try to diagnose the disease by clinical signs, very likely we're going to be late at detection. And there is no vaccine available, and we are far from that. I like this graphic about the different routes of infection of ASF. We have the route through the tick that's mainly reported in Africa through between the warthog and the domestic pig. We have the route of the feed, whether it's uh, contaminated raw materials or food scraps or swill feeding with contaminated pork. That's more common in backyard farming or like in Southeast Asia or even Russia where there's, there were still uh, backyard farming. Contact with the wild boar, that's more uh, Polonia, Eastern Europe. So Polonia, Romania, Russia, there's a big population of wild boars and they know no boundaries. They just get infected. They also suffer the disease and they die. The problem is that they, they don't die right away and they infect other, other wild boars. They die, snow falls on it. The virus survives through the winter when the snow melts and other boar, wild boar comes along, feeds on that carcass, gets infected, and continue, and the cycle continues. And that's, why, that's how the disease has been moving into Europe. And right now it's in Belgium. 
We have the direct contact peak to peak, so that's when you don't detect the ASF on time and you move infected pigs into another premises, let's say from a cell farm to a nursery or a GDU to a cell farm, they were infected, you don't, you don't detect it, and that's how you introduce the, the, the virus. Trucks and materials. So what happens in Russia or used to happen at the beginning on the first outbreaks is the producer, if it's small enough, let's say you know 500 pigs, if he comes one day and finds 100 pigs dead, he's not going to report it. He's gonna try to arrange transportation for those 400 pigs sent to the slaughter plant. The problem is that that truck that they use to move those 400 pigs will have high quantities of virus, and that truck may be the next day in another swine operation picking up cold sows or cold pigs, and uh, that facilitates the virus transmission uh, across the country. And uh, well, we already talked about the wild boar. So what are the Russian regulations or and in a slide? I mean, the regulations are way longer than this, but Concerning ASF, the Russian legislation has been to, you need to test for, uh, for ASF by PCR monthly, um, tissues of dead pigs and blood of the animals in the farm. And it's a way of monthly, you need to prove that your farm is negative. If you don't comply with this, you cannot move your pigs. Uh, if you need to move pig, let's say a south farm or a GDU, you need to submit samples of the pigs that are gonna be moved across state. So if I wanna move, from one state to another, I need to submit a representative amount of blood samples to the state lab, not your own. It has to be the state. They have to look at it and they say, yeah, you're negative, you're good to move. All the feed needs to be pelletized. That's a way to ensure that the feed gets treated with high temperatures and inactivates the virus. And all the farms need to have a fence and a disinfection barrier, which I'll show in pictures later. So this is a picture of of the new farms being built. This was the last farm they built in the company I was working on. So you can see the fence. This infection barrier is right here, uh, cremator. So we'll, we'll, I'll talk about this later. So what was the situation of ASF um, since the introduction in 2007? So it entered through the south. Georgia is here. Eastern Europe is here. So Poland, Belarusia, China is down here. So as you can see, it entered through the south and it made its way upwards. Each red dot represents a domestic outbreak. Of, so domestic pig outbreak, it could be backyard or commercial. And the blue ones represent the wild boar uh, cases. So very, very even, you know, it affected both populations. And it started to increase and in 2014, and the company I was working on, we had the first outbreak. And then in 2016, as you can see, a very active year, uh, we suffered a second outbreak. Uh, these are reported cases. So as in China, Russia also has a way of uh, controlling information and you know, it's not a, there are non-reported cases of ASF, of course, in, especially in this period. Okay, this is the situation now. And of course, this is the official uh, report. So way, this is only 2019. As you can see, less outbreaks. The company I was working on, we were right here in the heart of the, that's where the pigs are. That's like your Minnesota and Iowa in Russia. Um, so the situation is more or less under control. These are domestic pigs, but mainly smaller producers, uh, not the large ones. Uh, the blue ones are the wild boars. So the same, uh, the, the, that's the same as the previous map. So. Let's talk about how did we deal, um, as a company, how did we deal with the ASF? So first, the company I was working on had 80,000 sows. It was large, they were the second largest in Russia, fully integrated. Uh, it was a three-site uh, production system, meaning that there's a sow farm, a nursery, and two finishers assigned to each sow farm. A little different than the, the model here in the US where you have the sow farm and you have multiple winter finishers and you just, spread them around and move them across state. In Russia, it's very well controlled. Like you have this south farm and this south farm fits this huge nursery, f f continuous cycle, but huge. And then that nursery fits into two finishers that are also huge, 20,000 pigs each. And each farm was exactly the same. And most of the farms in Russia are like that. Uh, in December of 2014, so 24th of December, we detected ASF in 
in a multiplier, in a finisher site, so for those that are very well um, into swine production, you know that like one of the worst places you can get ASF could be a multiplier finisher because it, you increase the chance of moving those infected animals to your sow farms or to your quarantines. And this was the first case of ASF reported in a large um, in, a, in a large production system. So up until 2014, all those red dots were domestic pigs, but backyard or small operations. So in that 2014, you know, we were like uh, the joke of the industry in Russia. We we're like, hi, how could you miss it? How how did it enter? But as the years went by, everyone started to break. Not as much as China, but a lot of outbreaks. This is how we move our gills through the system. So we had the south farm, the nursery, and the finisher. It's a multi-site, but as you can see by the distance, it's one mile, it's not a lot, but still considered multi-site. Um, you have the, the GDU, or the gill developer unit, where we did the vaccinations and the testing, and then we move into the south farms. So this is where we, this is where we had the ASF detection. This is a picture of the, the model, the multiplication model. So we have the, uh, the finisher here. This is the south farm. And this is the nursery. Uh, yeah, one mile, maybe a mile and a half distance between them. But it is still considered uh, multi-site production. So the site at 60 rooms, hotel style, so a hallway in the middle, different rooms. Each room had a capacity for 2,000 pigs. So a total of 32,000 pigs in one farm. So when I mean huge, it's, yeah, big sites. We were delivering guilds every week. Every week, one room was assigned to send the selected guilds to the GDU. And the non-selected guilds and the barrels will go uh, to third-party customers. The guilds were tested for PERS because we wanted, and for ASF because the state required it. It was a requirement by the state to be able to move those guilds. It's a closer look of the site. As you can see, there's a hallway in the middle connecting the rooms. In, at the ground level, you can notice the fence. All the farms in Russia have that fence. It's not because of biosecurity, it's because of security, so theft, so people don't enter the farm. Uh, so it works both ways. And uh, you see a, a lot of illumination, so it actually looks like a prison at night. And uh, <laughs> So what do we see? Um, and I, I like to go day by day on this, because everyone, when they talk about ASF, and they're described like, how could you miss it? This is high mortality, all the dead pigs, you know, blood everywhere. And it is like that, but it is not like that from day one. And it is, again, I'm going to say it, it's different than the Chinese experience. The Chinese are reporting way higher mortalities and a faster spread of the virus than the one we had. So building in retrospective, because after we get detection, we start to contain the disease. After everything comes down in January, we start talking to the staff. So this is all information built in retrospective. So there, there could be some error on the, uh, on the days. But the staff claims that on day zero, they, let's call the day they started seeing something, there were five to six pigs affected in one or two pens in one of the 16 rooms showing just fever, purple, uh, purple ears, but a little bit only, reluctance to rise, and uh, mild scours. But we're talking about five, six pigs. So if it's a site with 32,000 pigs, does, that doesn't raise an alarm. They just apply treatment, you know, and come the next day. What happens is that by day three, the, the pigs don't recover, more pigs get affected, and the mortality starts to rise. And we get to a 3% increase. If this was a regular site of ours, probably we wouldn't have reported at this moment because that was still acceptable losses as, as a site. But because it was a multiplier, we were notified and all the, the movements were stopped. So we went to see the pigs. And we didn't see anything. I mean, uh, and not only me, we were, uh, the, the team is big. We were around six, seven veterinarians, both Americans and Russians, and we didn't see much. We still halted the movements, submit samples for testing for ASF, CSF, PERS, all the, the big ones. At that moment, results take a long time. We had to wait three days to get results because the only lab available was in Moscow. And we were six, seven hour drive south. And you know the labs, because they're requesting so many samples, they're always behind in giving their results. 
So we obtained results on day six, and they were negative. So we said, well, we have negative results. The, the room that is being affected, or at least showing clinical signs, are, is not the room that's planned to be sending guilds to the GDU. The room that is uh, planned to send guilds out is another room with no clinical signs. Their test came negative, so we're going to send those. So on day seven, we send the, the guilds without any clinical signs, so asymptomatic carrier pigs. Well, you can guess, because that's why I'm here talking about it. By day 10, the GDU reported, hey, what did you send us? You know, these animals are dying, like, uh, immediately. And the, the, and the multiplier finisher also says these pigs don't recover. Actually, more pigs start to get affected. The mortality continues to rise slowly but surely, little by little. So once the GDU reported the similar clinical signs, we retested and we got confirmation day 11 that you know you, we had ASF. At that moment, uh, it, it was obvious that we had something that, that we were moving, that we moved it to another site. So this is a summary of what I just explained. So day zero, that's when we think the staff believes they start to see something. Could have been more, you know, the, could have been more. You have the negative results on day three. On day seven, we moved those guilds, asymptomatic carriers that were negative, no clinical signs. But by day 10, the clinical signs get worse and we get confirmation on day 11. At that point, so this is, this is how we move our animals, remember from my previous slide. So this is where we got the outbreak. We move it to the GDU. But hopefully we were, I mean, not hopefully, thankfully we were able to detect it before we shipped any guild because this GDU was kind of like a continuous flow. I mean, it's huge sites, so it's almost impossible to empty them out completely. So we managed to uh, contain it to this site and not move it around to the commercial south farm. So that would have been around 40 to 50,000 sows lost. So it would have been devastating. I'm gonna show you some pictures from that outbreak. These are pictures from day 12 to 15, uh, post detection or post uh, clinical signs. What I, what I wanna show you is that ASF has different, uh, different clinical presentations. It can be as like this, like this, this is not saying ASF, it's very, mild or almost maybe a little piling, maybe some fever, but nothing major in that pen. And in that same room, if you walk a little, you start to see pigs more affected with hemorrhagic spots in the backs. Or if you notice the, the ears, the purple ears and the hooves, this is what we mainly see in the literature and in the, the studies they've done on experimental conditions you start to see more affected pigs. But remember, this is 16 days into the outbreak. And look how many, this is dead, but look how many pigs are not showing that. So what I wanna say is that, yeah, the lethality is high, but like uh, Dr. Casey said, it doesn't move as quick as we think. It's just, it has high lethality, but the contagi contagiosity, it's slow, at least it's slower than other viruses that we are used to work with. I pay, uh, draw your attention to this because you can see the coagulated blood. We, for a while, thought we had dysentery. You know, we got a swine dysentery at the beginning. You know, we had some fever, scours with blood. We thought we had dysentery. Then we understood that it was something much worse than that. Uh, this is the result, so empty pens. You know, we already pulled out most of them. When we do necropsies, probably if you already had confirmation that you have ASF, you probably don't want to be doing necropsy because the survivability of the virus on the blood is, and the quantity is very high and it survives very well. So if you're trying to contain a disease you pro and you already have confirmation, uh, you probably don't want to be doing necropsies because that's just going to make it harder for uh, this infection and actually it's going to facilitate virus spread to other farms, especially if it's a farm that's not completely sealed. Like in Russia, we were lucky that because of the winter, all our farms were very much sealed. <clears throat> seal, excuse me. So you have the spleen enlarged. There are a lot of pictures online where you can see huge spleens. This uh, kidney with the uh, hemorrhages or the petechias in the kidney. Uh, again, in the, the studies, experimental conditions, you can see way worse kidneys. This is the one we, we had in our outbreak. These are all pictures from our outbreak. 
And that wasn't constant. We opened a lot of pigs, and we did not find this in all the pigs. So keep that in mind that not always, you ne hopefully you never face this, but it's not always going to look like this. The, this was very consistent, the enlarged hemorrhagic lymph nodes. This was, we found that in most of the pigs we opened. Congested and enlarged uh, lungs, you know, and you can see some bacterial secondary diseases that happens. Hemorrhagic uh, intestines and with the diarrhea, as I was mentioning, we saw a lot of that. So what happened? How has Russia uh, contained ASF and how has been Russia been able to contain this uh, disease? I'm going to say I, I believe that Russia has got it right, at most of it. Uh, they're good at containing and they're good at, you know, living with ASF in the, in the area. So once, you, once they detect the virus, uh, they create a five kilometer radius around your farm and that is like the control zone. Um, then it's forbidden all the movement of pigs in and out of that zone. They restrict the movement of people. So only the people that actually need to go in can go in. The workers cannot leave the farm uh, until all the pigs are euthanized and the farm is disinfected. So in our case, the people in the farm had to stay there around for like 12 weeks, so three months living in a farm. Uh, there is, you start with the euthanasia of all the pigs on site, burial and burning of those carcasses. Then you go through an exhaustive uh, washing and disinfection protocols where you have to like dismantle the whole farm, and I will show you pictures later. Um, then they, you have to be one year without pigs in the farm. Why one year? No one knows. That's just the law. That's what they say. Other countries may have different regulations. I think China has six months, but they're not actually uh, implementing it or they're not enforcing it. In Russia, it is enforced. At least for us, it was because we were the first outbreak in a large system. So they really wanted to make an example out of us. Um, then you do a bioassay if you want, so you put sentinels in, or you can just fully repopulate. In our case, we did the sentinels. These, these are some pictures from the quarantine or containment protocol. So you have the truck uh, coming out of the control zone. This is uh, wood shavings with disinfectant. This is one of our workers spraying disinfectant into the tires. And this is a policeman from the Russian authorities. How effective is this as disinfectant? I don't know, we, we heard in the morning, I mean, we talked about food baths in the morning and how effective they are, but it's one of the layers or one of the requirements by the state. So this is one of the many holes that we had to dig to dispose 32,000 pigs on one site and 10,000 in, in the GDU. This is how it looked before and then when we finished opening it up. So you see 31st of December, 2014, so right around Christmas, New Year's Eve, perfect time for an ASF outbreak. Uh, you, this is uh, the pile of pigs. This is not ASF. This is us with the euthanasia method. So you try to uh, euthanize the animals in non-blood means because you don't want to facilitate the viral spread. You want to minimize the amount of blood. You also don't want them laying around in the outside in the territory like that. We learned that later. Uh, we, we were sacrificing and moving them faster than we could dig up the holes. And what, it, what happens is you end up with all these carcasses in the territory, and then you have to uh, think about scavenger birds, so you have to think about mice, uh, and a lot of things. You, you want to minimize that, so we started just keeping them inside of the rooms until we could bring them out right away and dump them in the hole. You want to minimize this. You don't want blood. Of course, it's going to happen, especially when we're talking about 32,000 pigs. You know, it's going to happen, but you want to minimize it. This just makes your, your harder the disinfection and easier for the spread. So when you get ASF, you want to contain it. You want to limit the amount of farms that get affected. Uh, then you dump them in the, in the pit and you put straws, tires, rubber, anything that you can find to facilitate the burning of the carcasses. Um, then you do like a visual inspection and you cannot cover it up until the authorities tell you that you can. How do they ensure that everything was burned properly? They don't. It's very, I mean, they cannot go inside of that pit, but they do want to see a lot of roasting and a lot of black before you, they allow you to cover it up. And once you cover it up, they, you know, period periodically you have to put like a calcium hypochlorite or lime or Anything that will, you know, disinfect or 
uh, eliminate the virus. This is a picture of the disinfection protocols inside of the barn. This is already after disinfection number two. Then you start to dismantle everything. You see all the feeders to the side. All the slats are lifted. All this white is calcium hypochlorite. And I'm not saying that's the most effective disinfectant. That's what was available. I mean, when we look at the most effective disinfectant for ASF, there wasn't enough of that product in the whole country available for us. So we just had to buy what, we ha what was available. And that was available in high quantities, and we just used it. Uh, we dismantled also all the feed lines. At that time, we were worried about feed being contaminated, so we wanted to make sure our feed lines were also clean and disinfected. Then you start to uh, spray this uh, um, calcium hypochlorite around the farm territory. This is not snow. This is the product. Just You want to create a harsh environment for the virus, so you do that during the outbreak, you know, to uh, avoid spread to other farms, and you do it after you eliminate all the pigs, because with all the movement and all the carcasses and all the blood, the quantity of virus that will be in the territory will be high, and you, if you want to repopulate, so you want to eliminate the virus. Then, uh, you, you, the same with the manure. The Russian legislation has like a ratio of how much you have to um, put per gram of manure, but we just eyeballed it because it's impossible to really know how much is in here. And we just put as much as we could into the pit, and then that manure also gets buried into the pits. So what happened uh, after the break, after we eliminated the pits, we disinfected the farm, what did we do? So the affected farm closed with 15% mortality. So that was our worst farm. In my, uh, that's why I'm saying that our situation was way different than what China is reporting. We're also, I believe that we were quicker at eliminating the pigs. So maybe we had given that virus you know, three, four more weeks, then it would have killed 50, 60 percent. We just were quicker, and we started the euthanasia on the most affected site, uh, rooms. Why? Because we wanted to, if we want, we believed that if we could prove negativity in the other rooms, we could keep those pigs. And actually, once we killed the first four rooms, the other 12 were testing negative. And we you know, argued that we don't need to kill them. We don't need to kill them. But at the end, the authority said, no, we need to make an example. The whole site needs to be euthanized and buried. So we had to uh, sacrifice all the pigs on site. Luckily, the South Farm and the nursery of that uh, model, remember, they were very close to each other. They remain negative. So reinforcing that the, what the theory says that they, there's not a lot of aerosol transmission of ASF. It's all about you know fomites and people with boots and equipment. We are the aerosol transmission by itself. ASF it has a hard time getting even within the site with internal biosecurity. We managed to keep it out of 12 rooms. So it is possible. It can be contained if we implement the right things. So going back to this. Psych, uh, graphic about the different routes of infection, we were trying to find out how did it enter. You know, after we did all this, we, wanted, we want to find who's guilty. In Russian culture, you need to find who's guilty. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the soft tick, it was 34th of December, we, and, uh, and the soft tick role uh, hasn't been described in Eastern Europe yet. That's more on Africa. So we ruled that out. I'm good on time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we also ruled out the, the, food, the feed because we were pelletizing all our feed. We had reliable raw material supplies. We didn't use any kitchen or food waste in, into our pigs. And uh, so we ruled that out. We also uh, ruled out the contact with the wild boars. We, uh, we had high fences. And it was in the middle of December. The population of boars is a little lower. They don't move as much. So we ruled that out. We see as potential routes of introduction, contact with direct pigs, well, that applies to the, the, the GDU. We moved asymptomatic carriers from the multiplier finisher into the GDU. We did that ourselves. We didn't know they were infected, and we moved them. We see this, the materials, the trucks, as uh, the most likely route of introduction. Uh, as you saw in my first map, there was a, a lot of ASF outbreaks in the area. And knowing how Russians react to outbreaks, where they just go and sell all their pigs before they all die, 
uh, and the trucks they use, very likely two days later or even the day after, that same truck that they use to move infected pigs can be in another company or our company picking up non-selected gills or barrels. That's what we think was the most likely level route. Hunters, Russians like to hunt, so we also see that as a potential route. So what did we learn? I mean, after, after a, such a huge outbreak where you lose around 40,000 pigs, uh, the company needs to, okay, you clean it, we disinfect, we repopulate, but what can we do to, to avoid a future outbreak? And as a large system, we were also looking to enlarge, you know, and grow as a company, and we, we, we've done it, but we needed to have a plan in order to do that. And I'm gonna walk you through all the steps we did to reinforce our, our biosecurity. So we built our own lab because we, we realized we needed reliable testing. We did test those pigs on day three and the results came back late and we got a false negative. And thanks to that, we move animals from one side to another thinking they were negative. So the company went ahead and built their own lab and, and with fast results, we can actually know if those pigs are truly negative before moving them. We moved to active surveillance on farms maybe not as, int as intensive as China, like daily, but we did move to a weekly testing. And if it's a site that's uh, like a multiplier, we went twice a week, uh, testing for PCR, ASF. We started doing biosecurity audits. Uh, if, if all of you were in the morning presentation about biosecurity, it's always fun when we find stuff in biosecurity audits. We have all these biosecurity protocols, but when we go to the farms and you try to see the implementation, that's when the fun starts. And you see a lot of, a lot of things that you didn't know that were happening right, right below your nose. So we also went ahead and bought a lot of live haul trucks. When I got to the company, they had around 65, 70,000 sows. And then throughout the years, we've enlarged to 82,000. But we didn't, be, we didn't buy more trucks. And that was, I don't know, we didn't think of that as a, uh, a necessity. But when we started to organize our, our transportation, trying to segregate the fleet, trying to assign certain trucks to certain sites and regions, we realized we don't have enough trucks. So we went ahead and bought a lot and started segregating, you know, so the, putting color code in it. So this goes to the packing plant, this goes to internal movements, another color for the multiplier, trying to segregate your, your movements. We had daily updated maps with ASF to try to avoid our trucks to go through those areas. Sometimes it's inevitable, but when it was possible, we avoided those areas. We installed transport, transfer stations in all the farms. Uh, this is one of the requirements by the Russian authorities. So this is a tractor with a little wagon that pushes around seven to eight pigs. And the pigs walk through this transfer station here and the truck will be parked right here. So that way you avoid, if you do it right, you avoid the contact between the truck driver and the truck with the, with the farm. Because uh, the trucks are not always properly clean and disinfected, especially when they come from a slaughter plant. We also invested on cremators on site, also a requirement by the Russian uh, law for the new site, so you need to have a cremator to avoid all the rendering services. That truck that goes farm to farm picking up dead animals, so if one disease is in one farm, very likely the next three are going to get it also. Um, we started to spray for ticks in the farm areas. Uh, even though the, the, the tick role hasn't been uh, um, proven in Eastern Europe or, or Russia, we didn't want to be the first ones again to prove something, so we were spraying for ticks um, especially when this, there are uh, African swine fever outbreaks in the area. We installed disinfection barriers, so this is disinfectant. The trucks that are going to the farm have to go through this uh, pool or pit. How effective it is, we don't know. We haven't tested it, but it's one of the requirements to be able to, to get the highest compartment of the Russian uh, law. And I will talk about compartments in a second. So we also had the shower in, shower out r rules. We didn't go as far as having someone to monitor the showers. We didn't go that far. But we did put sensors that when the, when the worker enters to take the shower, the other door won't open for the next five minutes. So that worker has two options, whether he takes a shower or he sits and you know, waits five minutes and then walks to the other side. 
In the other side, there will be a biosecurity operator, like making sure the hair is wet, but nothing more than that. And this is the boots. Um, we change their boots, so we, we, they, when they get to the farm, to the security checkpoint, they change their boots and they walk like around 500 meters, and then they enter the shower area where they take the shower and put on farm clothing. The compartmentalization, that's, uh, I think that's the key. That's how Russia has been able to control the disease, being able to, instead of working as a region or regionalization, as a compartment. There were so many outbreaks in our areas, like we would have had to sacrifice a lot of pigs if we didn't have compartment, because when when you comply with a set of biosecurity regulations by, by the law, then you get like a status of, you know, the highest biosecurity status. And that means that if there is an ASF outbreak in your control area, like uh, four ki five kilometers around you, but you can prove that you're negative and you have no epidemiological link to that site, you get to keep your farm. You may not move pigs for a couple of weeks until that outbreak is resolved but you get to keep your pigs at the end of the day. Truck washers, we invested heavily on it. So we built two or three more uh, washing, uh, truck washers to be able to you know, keep up with all the trucks. We never allowed any food. I mean, we never allowed, uh, we, we always provided the food to the workers. It was one of their benefits, uh, but we, they could always bring some stuff, like if they make a cake or if a special occasion, they will come and bring stuff. We had to forbid that uh, because you never know when they bring a sausage or a, you know that's infected, and we wanted to avoid that. So we will ship the food to them. We had a, like a kitchen in each region controlled by us. We will make sure that you know feeding chicken and vegetables, everything cooked, nothing, nothing raw. So you will think with all this we will never get an African swine fever outbreak, but. No, that's why I'm here. We had a second one in 2016. Yeah. Uh, we, I have two more slides. I, I, I didn't know that. 36 minutes. I've got my, my watch right here. OK. So let me just tell you that we had an outbreak here in 2016. 300,000 pigs in the area, all hours. It would have been devastating. We managed to detect it within a day with two dead gills, tested positive for PCR, stop movements, uh, retested positive, starting sacrificing. We managed to keep all these sites negative. If we didn't have the active surveillance and the, lab the reliable laboratory testing, very likely we would have weaned piglets to this nursery, infected, and then by the time we detect with the clinical signs, we would have lost at least this pot, which was around uh, 100,000 pigs. So. Yeah, it was bad to get a second outbreak, but at least um, we managed to contain it to one side this time. So all animals were euthanized. Uh, the, all, every, all the other sites remained negative. And investigations led to work in having infected pigs at home. Uh, everyone asked me, how did it get in? Well, in this case, we do know. We found a worker that had pigs at home. She had buried the pigs because they had died. We dug it up, tested, ASF positive. So that's smoking gone, or at least as close as you can get. So my take home message is that people acting as fomites were most likely responsible for ASF introductions into farms, at least in Russia. China may be different, but in Russia, every time we talk to colleagues and other veterinarians, people, people moving with boots, trucks, they are the ones facilitating viral spread. So with that, I'll take questions. And I lasted 37 minutes. <laughs> Nice presentation, Gustavo. Thank you. So you, you mentioned uh, about the compartmentalization and being able to demonstrate that you, you don't have any epidemiological connections. How did you do that? Because there's so many possibilities, right? Well, you have to work closely with the Russian authorities. So they, they have the last call. So they trace all your movements. Kind of, it's kind of like what uh, the secure pork supply is trying to implement here. So traceability, knowing where the pigs are, where they are going, uh, the feed source, 
all the movements, do map them, and then the Russian state vet says, okay, yeah, well, you can consider this a compartment, this can be considered like a different compartment, and if you have these three, four things, like disinfection barriers, transfer stations, we might consider even the farm a single compartment. And that's how it's been working. I mean, in that case, we, we should have killed more than just one farm, but because of compartment, we managed to keep all these pigs. We were not able to move for a couple of weeks, but it's, it's complex. I mean, I'm just with, it will take me longer than a couple of minutes to explain to you, but Russian authorities working with producers very closely. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Lopez, uh, kind of three, three questions. One is, uh, how, how did you euthanize them? And then secondly, I, I can only imagine taking up the slats on a finisher, and you showed a picture. They actually took up all the slats, and then if I heard you right, you said you took the manure out of the pits and put them in with the pigs, the dead pigs. Is that, are those? Okay, so the first question we use, a, for most of the rooms, we use an injectable intramuscular product. Uh, then we ran out of that product, and we had to rely on suffocation, so we shut down ventilation. Uh, the welfare issue in Russia is not very big, and they actually wanted to, you know, let's contain this disease. Your second question was, well, I remember the third. The manure, yeah, we, not with the pigs, a different pit. So a pit just for the manure. It wasn't sprayed into the fields. Uh, it was December, so there was n nowhere to, to second spray. second question was, you took all the slats up to clean underneath the slats? Yeah, all of them, and uh, we had to sign a platoon of people. I mean... The people on farm, we, that site had like 12 workers, and we had to send like 50 more, and they all live in the farm. So it was three months living in that farm. We had to send mattresses, equipment, everything. So not, I mean, it wasn't fun. Here we go, one more question. Yep. Thanks for the updates. Back to your active surveillance. Can you expand a little bit? Because if, if we think about, I'm, with no clinical signs, you got very low prevalence. Are you just are you testing clinical pigs, or are you just doing a lot of testing? Because it seems like you'd have low prevalence, and therefore to have any chance of finding it, you must be testing a lot of samples, or just walk through your active surveillance. So we're doing both. So we are any dead animal in, the, in this second outbreak. It was two dead gills, sudden death in the same pen. So that raised an alarm, like you know this. Gilled, mature, it had a lot of space, so we tested those. But in case we don't have any clinical signs, we're testing every week the pigs that are going to be moved. So if we, we usually target the piglets, because if we get ASF, we at least want to contain it to the south farm. In the nursery, we try to target the pigs that are due to be sent to the finisher, and so try to target a little bit. But yeah, it's a matter of luck. We don't. At that low prevalence, to really be confident that you're negative, you're going to have to sample way too many pigs. And with that, are you bleeding oral fluids? What's kind of your methodology? So we were at that time we were bleeding, but as I understand, they're doing the our laboratory is validated for oral fluids, and they're doing oral fluids now. Okay. But the state vet doesn't approve that. Like for the state vet, he only recognizes blood as a negative test. So the oral fluid part. Uh, we're doing it like internally for our movements, but the state vet is requiring the blood. We've used up our time. Please help thank Dr. Lopez for being with us. Thank you.